Thank you very much, Judy, and um, thank you to the ICLS uh, team for inviting me to come here. It was uh, a real honor when that email landed in my inbox to, to invite me to come and speak at ICLS. Uh, so I really appreciate the opportunity that uh, I have got today. I hope that you find it, it's uh, worth your while and that I'll shed one or two new angles for you um, from the journey that I've been walking on some quite contemporary issues at the moment. Uh, coming back to Britain, I've been in Sydney for four years now, and coming back to Britain always feels special. Coming back to UCL, particularly for me, uh, because in 1987, when I was merely Simon Shum, before I married Jackie Buckingham, uh, I was doing my MSc in ergonomics just at the other end of this building. So, you know, I stood at, stood at the bottom of those steps and looked up at the door and remembered walking out of there at 2 and 3 a.m. in the morning when I was working on my project. Uh, that was special. UCL is also special to me because, rewind a few more years, my dad was here in 61, joining the British space team that UCL was really leading the space sort of uh, uh, academic program. And here he is in front of a supercomputer uh, looking, at telemetry, looking at telemetry data from one of the first British satellites. Um, so, UCL, here I am. Dad, I hope you can see me now. Okay, nobody gets to do anything meaningful in this space without a great team. And so, uh, I really want to acknowledge everybody in Kick. You can follow that link and, and read all about them. Um, remarkable team that uh, that I've got there that have helped me do this, this kind of work. Okay, um, so here's the word, infrastructure. Um, rather like on Monday when um, uh, Iris Tabak shared her experiences and lessons learned when she looked at the learning sciences through the lens of the quantified self movement, I want to take you on a journey and share, you, share with you some of the lessons I've learned when I've looked at what social technical uh, studies of science and infrastructure are revealing. So when we think about infrastructure, we normally think about the stuff that's in the background. It just makes stuff work, hopefully. You know, we press the light switch, we pick up the phone, we send an email, we type a URL in, and there's an awful lot of stuff going on that we don't really want to think about. But when you look at infrastructure through the lens of social scientists, it becomes clear that this is way more than just technology and standards going on here. There is a whole human system that was created to, to invent that and that sustained it and helped it embed into everyday life. And um, the interesting thing is that when we think about infrastructure for what we do as researchers and practitioners and educators, that is changing quite fast. Um, and we need to be thinking very reflectively about that. So there's a lot of concern at the moment out there, uh, and hopefully in here too, about data, privacy, ethics, uh, how algorithms can be biased, uh, how AI can or cannot understand the complexities of human life. And so it falls to us, surely, to build infrastructure for education that is trustable. And it's an empirical question what it means for something to be trusted by a particular kind of person. Moreover, infrastructure, as I've said, wants to be invisible. I love the, the sort of, you know, the expression, information wants to be free. You know, well, infrastructure wants to be invisible. And, uh, it wants to sink into the background. It very quickly sinks into the background. You know, how, we, don't, we just pull our phones out and we do stuff, and, you know, we weren't doing that 10 years ago. It just becomes part of the system. But... That's very dangerous when the infrastructure is mediating the way we see the world, the way we see our learners, uh, the way that we judge success. Because that infrastructure is hardly neutral. You know, as uh, has been often pointed out, models are systematic ways of distorting the world, simplifying the world, so that we can focus on certain things and just shove other things out of, into the background. But as the social, social uh, scientists will point out to us repeatedly, um, a model, an ontology, a database classification scheme, an algorithm is simply a bunch of assumptions that have been codified. 
And when that just sinks into the background, because no one wants to really understand it, they just want stuff to happen, that could be dangerous. OK, we'll come back to infrastructure in a moment. I want to uh, tell you about an amazing new piece of augmented reality kit that I, I got just uh, about a month ago. And it's actually transformed the way that I see the world. It's changed the way that I engage with my devices. It's changed the way that I actually engage with other people. And it's this pair of super lightweight specs, which actually I'm wearing right now. Amazing piece of engineering. And if you look very, very closely, you will never find a piece of digital technology in that. <laughs> okay. It's pure analog, but of course produced using amazing digital technology. And the interesting thing is they're multifocals. I've never had multifocals before. Um, but now I can, I can read the writing on my clicker. I can look up and see all of you, and you're all sharp. And that's, that's quite exciting. So, you know, close up, it's clear. I can go take my dog out now, and we can see down the pathway, but I can stop. And without taking my glasses off or putting my short ones on, I can now zoom in and look at the fern. Um, and it turns out in Australia, in the woods near me, these ferns grow pretty big as well. So there's a sort of fractal thing going on here as well. OK, now, why am I telling you about my specs? Because we need to think multifocal today. Uh, we need to think about how we zoom in and out of this knowledge infrastructure and look at it at different scales. And a word that you know well in the ICLS community, multivocal as well. I couldn't resist that. It's multifocal, but we have to be multivocal as well. We need these different disciplines. So try on my specs for the next uh, a few minutes as we look with long distance, big picture specs, lenses, and also some close up lenses at what it means to build learning analytics systems with integrity, I hope. Okay, so I'm coming from the learning analytics community. Um, like uh, ICLS, like the learning sciences, we are a, a convergence of many tributaries. Um, we, we're a new kid on the block. We've only been here for you know, nine years or so. Um, when the first conference was held in 2011. Um, we recognize that we are a sort of convergent discipline, um, and we spend a lot of time trying to build links with the other key disciplines that we need to have on board as we try and think about automating aspects of, of, of the assessment process, the feedback <coughs> process. So you can see some of the keynote speakers that we've had from their different disciplines. Um, but we're also in a, in a field that's getting intense interest from um, business, industry and government, because there's so much investment and hype around big data and so forth. And we cannot afford to be not talking to the, the major players in this space. And we'll come back to the, the kinds of players that they are. But we have industry people woven into the way that we handle, um, run our conferences. Of course, we have sponsorship. Um, but we, we, we have to have a very high quality dialogue with the people who are actually building the tools, the platforms, that your school or university will be buying next year or the year after. Okay? Those things don't happen by magic. Someone somewhere is making decisions about what meaningful learning looks like and how you automate that process. And if we are not heavily engaged with them, then we have a problem. Now, the Educate program that, that we've been seeing here, that Rose has been leading, introducing startups to the learning sciences, fantastic. You know, that's, that's one way of bridging um, that, that gulf between the people out there building the, the stuff that gets sold and, and what we do here in academia. But you know, in the next 10 years, you, know, you will each have written another 20 papers, 50 papers, landed more grants, uh, built your resumes. How much of that will have impacted the products that your university or school will be buying? That's, that's the challenge. That's the shaping design rather than shouting from the sidelines strap line for this talk. OK. What is learning analytics? Well, it's a collision of two different worlds, which are quite different in some ways. It's not a straightforward conversation, how you, how you bridge from one to the other. Um, and that's very much what the learning analytics community is about. And as I'll be showing you, it's, 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 it's brilliant to see the conversation that's now going on in the learning sciences about how they engage with computational techniques. But there is a missing circle. And the missing circle, in my view, is human factors. Human factors at many scales. Human factors in terms of how we involve stakeholders. You know, 
How do we involve a teacher who doesn't know anything about analytics in the design of an analytics tool that we want them to trust and use? How do we involve students? Good grief. Actually involving students in the systems that are going to track them, right? There is a field called participatory surveillance design. Okay? We'll be coming back to that later because we have a lot to learn from HCI. Okay? We're building this tool. It's going to track you in very high fidelity and you know, all sorts of decisions are going to be made off the back of that. Is that creepy? Are you happy? Are you, are you appalled? Would you expect no less from us? You know, the, you know, it's our responsibility as a university to be both ethical and to do everything in our power to help you succeed. Okay? All sorts of interesting conversations to have. All the usual usability stuff, of course, privacy and ethics. Organizational strategy, right? You're beavering away, trying to get something used in your university. Your leadership is not interested, okay? There is only so far you're going to go. Staff training. Sounds, you know, it's boring, but that's actually what will make or break the adoption of these tools in many cases. If the staff aren't on board, if they don't see the win, well, good luck. Okay, so that is the sort of tripartite, human-centered design discipline that I would, I would argue is what we're about in learning analytics. We are not just a research discipline. We are trying to change the world in whatever way we can manage. And for that, we need all the expertise we, we can get in design. Okay, now when I come to uh, ICLS and look at the papers, and when I read a lot of uh, stuff about learning analytics, it's quite clear that some, one group is perceived to be a beneficiary, okay? And that is the researcher, right? Um, we have got some amazing power tools now to study education, uh, to study the learning process, okay? And you might look at the fourth paradigm book, if you haven't seen that, written by computer scientists, they're very computer science-y, but saying, look, we've been through three paradigms in science. There is a fourth one now, and it's data intensive. Okay? Um, it doesn't mean a theoretical. It just means there are completely new ways of coming at data sets and asking questions than we did before. Um, of course, there is you know, the, the way that we communicate as researchers, the way that we could share data sets, the kind of you know, computing firepower that we can call down now from Amazon Web Services or Azure or any of the other you know, cloud providers is amazing. right? And there's a whole piece around what should the educational e-research infrastructure look like now? You know, when the sample size could be every, everybody. It doesn't have to be some small sample that you only had capacity to, to gather data from. What happens when basically you're going to find something significant in a huge data set? It's pretty hard not to. But, you know, that, that's no longer an adequate criterion. Uh, what does it mean when this painstaking qualitative coding we used to do could be done at least partially by a machine now, right? Huge expansion of the data sets you can, call, you can pull in, um, and so forth. Um, what happens when social ties can be tracked at scale? Okay, now this talk isn't really about that, but it's clearly part of it, right? So, you know, I'd refer you to work by Cope and Kalansis and Mark Escape. These links will all be available on the slides afterwards, by the way, so don't worry, who have written already very articulately about what the implications might be for the role of the educational researcher in the future. Who are learning analytics for? Shock, horror, they're for learners, and they're also for educators. Okay. Um, so I'll quote you something from a chapter that I wrote with Simon Knight for the Handbook of Learning Analytics. This is the possibility, right, that educators and learners, the actual people who constitute the system we're studying, are for the first time able to see their own processes and progress, right, rendered in ways that until now were the preserve of researchers. This stuff is becoming available as infrastructure, okay? That's, that's, that's part of the vision, that it's no longer the researchers in the labs with the, with the high-power tools who get to visualize dynamics of so social dynamics or, or, or visualize what's going on in the online learning system. This is just going to become part of business as usual. And hopefully, you know, it's something that we can then feed back. We're talking about creating feedback loops, right? That is what all the interest in big data is about. Tracking complex systems, whether it's banking or finance or health, capping, tracking complex systems and closing the feedback loops faster so you can sense what's going on, 
detect changes in following interventions. And of course, feedback is just this massive issue for education. Right? We know that the, you know, the best learning happens when you have timely, actionable, personalized feedback. But there is lots of worry at the moment out there, and it's not unjustified, that we're the bad guys. Right? We're the people who want to quantify everything. You know, bloody computer scientists, you think you can count everything, you think you can measure everything, and you're just part of this big thing going on out there, like them. You know, that's what learning analytics is. That's what AI is. You're trying to automate stuff you can't be automating. You've got these reductionist, you know, simplistic views about complex human phenomena. You just want to count stuff, and goodness knows where that data is going. That is the context we're working in, and we cannot ignore that now. Okay. So part of what I'm trying to, to talk about today is how we build systems with integrity, how we build systems that can answer the kinds of tough questions that people should legitimately be asking us. These books are doing a fantastic job of making available to the general public some of the, some of the bad stuff that's going on as people start to automate without thinking. Or they thought really hard, but they just simply didn't understand what the consequences were going to be. Okay? Weapons of math destruction, algorithms of oppression. Um, great work going on by Dana Boyd's Data Society Institute. Um, I really recommend you take a look at some of that work. Okay? They're now producing, you know, what is algorithmic accountability? Just, for, just to get people engaged with these kinds of topics. Okay, there is, it's not just the mass media and hysterical journalists out there. Um, you know, within academia, there are lots of social scientists watching our field. You know, I mean, I've never been in a field where someone was writing books about the emergence of my field, right? But Ben Williamson um, at Sterling at the moment, and uh, you know, he writes you know cogently and passionately about the datafication of education at all levels, about who owns this data, and about the entrance of commercial entities about students having opportunities closed down instead of opened up, and, many, and much, much more. So, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's an interesting book. Now, the question for us is, you know, to what extent is all of that justified? Uh, and how do we tell our story in a way that we feel has integrity? Because we're the people building these systems. We actually know what it takes to build these systems, as opposed to people who are commentating, you know, but are at, at more of a distance. That's important. We had Neil Selwyn in Sydney uh, at the LAC conference this year. I was very keen to bring him in. Neil, giving us a hard time about the fact that we're not taking seriously the way that these issues are being perceived outside. Okay. So another you know, uh, very able academic providing commentary for us to, to be reflecting on. I love Jeff Bowker and Lee Starr's work, you know, sorting things out. Read that book if you don't read any other book. Um, the way that we can systematically erase things using classification schemes. And now we see that popularized in books like The Tyranny of Metrics, just, you know, just out at the moment. Okay? Um, classification schemes, classifiers, automatic and human, are erasing things and making decisions about what gets remembered and what gets forgotten. That's, that's serious work. Gay and Pryke, okay, Many people have said these things, but you know, when we start to measure stuff, when there are humans involved, guess what? We start to behave differently. We start to respond to the high stakes classifications that we're being asked to dance to. And we start shaping reality. So um, these are the kinds of critiques which, which we need to be taking on board and responding to intelligently. So there's learning analytics, but um, the, 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 the situation, the, the, the field is becoming much more complex now. Okay, we have the learning platform services out there now, mostly pushing us all into the cloud as fast as they can. So it's no longer on-premises. We have the adaptive learning analytics services who are you know, taking advantage of the intelligent tutoring technology that's now well and truly out of the lab and are starting to power the kinds of um, um, experiences that many students are having obviously sitting on a lot of data. We are into a new policy regimes now with GDPR in Europe, 
and every, you know, every country trying to figure out what to do about, um, about data and privacy. We have the publishers. We have, you know, obviously, we've got, it's great. We've got Pearson, McGraw-Hill, Wiley. All the publishers are becoming absolute powerhouses. They're sitting on so much data, and they're hiring our best postdocs, right? And I was having an interesting chat with, with Kirsten this morning about how they manage, you know, ethics review and so forth. They have ethics review processes. Do we know what they are, right? There is a perception that it's just a wild west out there, and these guys are just going at data without a thought about ethics. Well, no, it's not true. But, you know, I was saying to her, you know, you guys have to get that counter-narrative out there as well. And then we have governments who want to count stuff. They want league tables of schools and universities. You know, we have, you know, organizations like UNESCO and the OECD trying to index and metricize and evidence progress in their various, you know, initiatives. Of course, they need, they need to be able to evidence this stuff. Um, and then we have, you know, uh, some very big philanthropic, philanthropic foundations, lots of venture capitalists, the whole ed tech scene, right? So this is a complicated ecosystem now, and that's the mesh, that's the web in which we're doing our learning analytics. We cannot be doing this as academics in some bubble, right? We have to be playing in this system. And so it's these big shifts in the knowledge infrastructure. This is the knowledge infrastructure, and the, there are more bubbles I should be putting up there as well. And that's why I want to introduce you to, to the, the lens of knowledge infrastructures. Uh, and we'll also talk about Pasteur's quadrant. And those are my sort of long distance lenses. So I have been greatly enjoying reading Paul Edwards' work, was at Michigan, now at Stanford, who has studied the vast machine that is the mechanism by which we understand how our planet's changing. Okay? And then more recently, you can get this at knowledgeinfrastructures.org, a great report from a workshop held on, on knowledge infrastructures in general, you know, beyond building on and expanding uh, Edward's work. What is a knowledge infrastructure? It's a robust network of people, artifacts, institutions, generating, sharing, maintaining specific knowledge about the human and natural world. And we might think about the, you know, the uh, inter intergovernmental uh, panel for climate change, the weather system, the Center for Disease Control. These are stable, well-functioning knowledge infrastructures. But they're not designed systems. They evolve, and they are systems of systems. And they interoperate both te technically through standards and, uh, and, 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 and computing interoperability and through the ways that people just learn to work with each other. And, you know, when I read that, I'm thinking, okay, that sounds like the educational ecosystem to me. Um, and it's getting more complicated. Models, it's models all the way down, okay? Um, this is how we see the planet. You know, the satellites out there are only seeing the planet through models, okay? Um, and similarly, you know, within our own field, um, machines see learners through models. Um, I love Jeff Bowker's um, statement, you know, raw data is an oxymoron, okay? Uh, on the contrary, he follows, it should be cooked with care, right? So the idea that there's such a thing as raw data is just a com complete misconception from the perspective of infrastructures people, because someone somewhere has decided which data is important to capture and which ones to ignore, and at what, at what resolution, and how, you know, et cetera, et cetera. A whole bunch of assumptions and worldviews have been put in just to capture the, quotes, raw data, okay? So as we see learners and teachers through models, digital models, codifying our worldview, we better have a very good understanding about how you move from a theory into a formalized piece of model, into a code. What kind of analytical purchase do we get by looking at the knowledge infrastructure's perspective? A nice, nice perspective here, uh, this concept of infrastructural inversion. Okay, what does that mean? So part of Edward's work is looking at how people have evolved over time, ways of measuring what's going on with the planet. Okay? And then you continually want to go back to old data, but bring modern day techniques to analyze the old data. Right? And so they were continually looking at their infrastructure. And uh, that seems to me to be an extremely healthy approach to take when it comes to learning analytics infrastructure. We have to keep lifting the lid 
on, on these. It's not that everybody wants to know what's going on under the bonnet, right? I don't want to know what's going on in my car either, right? But I, I want somebody who does, and I want them to be accredited uh, when, when, when stuff's gone wrong, right? Okay? And we as researchers in the field, we have to continually be showing that we can lift that lid and we can poke around in the engine if we need to. Okay. Moreover, because I'm interested in learners and educators engaging with these systems, not just researchers, we need to teach them how to engage critically with these tools. And that's been a theme here with various talks around agency, who has the authority to interpret when the machine says one thing and the human thinks something else. Okay. Metadata friction, another nice one. Okay, so um, this is the problem of taking old data and merging it with new data, understanding where that data came from. And similarly, we might think now that we have all these lovely power tools. We can go through our old data, but recovering enough context and metadata about where that came from, even your own data, never mind somebody else's, that's going to be an issue. I also want to point out that um, uh, there is work going on within the learning sciences already around the concepts of infrastructure. I want to draw your attention to the work that Lena Markusgate and Peter Goodyear have been doing um, around professional knowledge. And this is a taxonomy from their book of what they call epistemic infrastructure. And they talk about some of the things that Edwards talks about, uh, boundary infrastructures, and, um, uh, uh, and, and, and um, general codes of practice. But they, they make particular contributions, I think, at looking at the micro-knowledge infrastructure, how a professional constructs his or her epistemic tools around them in order to get work done. OK, so the argument then is that education's inf knowledge infrastructure may be transitioning. The seams are starting to pull apart in Edwards' language. Okay, and that happens especially when you've got rapid technological change, but the human systems have got way more inertia and are struggling to keep up. What do we expect to see when a knowledge infrastructure is in transition? Norms, relationships, ways of thinking and acting start to get impacted. Change, they change authority, influence, and power. We're gonna, we, you know, so we might be starting to think, okay, who within the educational ecosystem is starting to have more power than, than, than they used to. Okay. New kinds of knowledge work and workers are displacing old ones. Think about how's that playing out within the educational scene. Increased access for some may mean reduced access for others. Huge social implications. You know, this is a version of the impact of automation on the workforce. And I think that it helps to explain some of the things that we're now seeing, okay? We're asking, well, should we really be outsourcing student feedback to machines developed by an ed tech company in Silicon Valley? Okay? That's not something that used to be done by anybody other than our own academics and tutors. There's obviously alarm about the political agendas driving the collection of certain educational data. There's concern about commercial drivers and who owns data. There are worries about the fact that you know, maybe we're going to be starting to rewind the clock because AI, for many people, is just completely associated with intelligent tutoring, instructivist paradigms. So lo lots of legitimate questions as these seams start to get pulled apart and people are doing new things. We see very poor interoperability um, between platforms and data sets. It's just a sign of our immaturity as a field. We see very early products going out, which are counting stuff that's easy to count, but it doesn't count for learning, right? It gives us all a bad name, right? Um, we see a growing recognition of the data illiteracy within universities and schools. We do not have principals, never mind teachers, who really know how to work closely with data. And universities are finding that now that their platform's in the cloud, they didn't read the small print very carefully. They didn't do enough testing. They didn't ask questions like, can we get this data, and when, and how, and in what forms? And suddenly, data that used to be on-premises and completely owned by them is now being mediated through a set of APIs that they don't understand and haven't tested properly. It shows us why we're starting to see people pulling machine learning off, off the shelf and just throwing it at data. 
in a, in a very kind of clumsy ways and, and, and completely illiterate about the fact that it may have been biased in certain ways in the data or the algorithms. We see poor grounding of analytics and theories of learning, but that's something that we're working on, and we'll come back to that in a moment. We, see, we saw a very early fascination, which really came from the business industry, of trying to predict student failure. Right? Predictive models was, and, and for some is still, a huge issue. Um, uh, I'm uncomfortable with that for, for quite a few reasons, but it assumes that the past can and should predict the future. That means that we don't want to be continually innovating our pedagogy, updating the curriculum, changing the assessments, because then our historical data won't predict the future so well. So let's keep things static. And um, we have argued, and I'll come back to this later, that you know, within, even within learning analytics, as we figure out who we are, clearly we're computer scientists to some point, to some degree. That doesn't mean that the criteria for success are precision, recall, and F1 values. Right? The criteria for success are more than rock curves. They have to be about educational outcomes, ultimately. OK, so um, Edwards and, and, and all the others who have been working on this then say, so what do we do? You know, we see a knowledge infrastructure in transition. What do we do? First thing, don't stand on the, on the sidelines. Social scientists have got to figure out how to get engaged. Number two. We need to sort of rethink our research practices so that they're actually proactively shaping and rebuilding knowledge infrastructures that we think are fit for purpose. And they argue, it's a sort of call to arms, really. Let's treat this as a design opportunity. Let's create a cadre at the interface between scientists and software. I get very excited about that. You know. That's us. That's our PhD students. These are the people we have to train who can talk both languages, who can broker between the worlds that are now coming together. And we need to use participatory design techniques because that's how you get the different vo voices in the room and you know, beyond the guys who are just building the tech. OK, and really what I want to try and show you is what this, what this will look like or what it could look like. OK, but first, another pair of lenses, Pasteur's Quadrant. Um, some of you will be familiar with this. Um, Donald Stokes was asking, to what extent is your research driven by considerations of use or a quest for fundamental understanding? Okay. And he characterized a quadrant down there, which is essentially doing neither. And you think, well, what's the point of that work? Well, early pre-theoretical taxonomizing of flora and fauna. Okay. We didn't have a proper theory then thank goodness it was done, because then Darwin could pull it together into something coherent. We've got Edison relentlessly trying to invent electrical, commercially viable lighting. Not really worried about advancing physics or anything like that. That's valuable work. That's fine. You know. We've got Bohr doing foundational work on, you know, in physics. And then we've got Pasteur, who wants to control disease, but he can't do that unless he really understands bacteria. OK. Well, we have the Manhattan Project, you know, trying to build a bomb, but, you know, having to do some pretty serious physics en route. Or Keynes, he wants to control economics, but he has to come up with a whole set of foundational concepts en route. OK. So where do we sit? Where does the learning sciences and analytics sit? Well, down here in Edison's quadrant, we might say, well, this is learning analytics just designed to try and improve outcomes in a specific context. It might be pulling on theory. It might not be. Um, uh, and it doesn't, doesn't have any particular ambition to feed back into basic theory. Over on the left there, we've got learning sciences into the foundational constructs and processes of learning, or the computer scientists who are simply building more, you know, optimizing algorithms or... Um, trying to uh, build better architectures for cloud computing, et cetera. OK, now this is the space that we're interested in, right? In particular, when we're trying to actually shape infrastructure. OK, so learning sciences has developed a whole suite of methodologies for trying to not only advance the foundational concepts, but to make that a sustainable intervention that will live on after the grants run out. OK. Um, design-based research, improvement science, research practice partnerships, collaborative data intensive improvement. I want to just put a shout out for that book. It's 
probably one of the most mature books out there at the moment about how schools can engage with data science, where you treat the practitioners as equals, uh, mutually learning with and from the data science researchers. Now, when it comes to learning analytics, we have a particular burden. We actually want to build functioning systems, right? So we have to design and deploy systems that demonstrate how a particular theory can actually be formalized, coded, create a user experience, embed it into teaching practice. We can learn all of that a lot from learning sciences methodologies, but we have actually got to build functioning software too. And hopefully, we will be then feeding back because, as in many other fields, once you can demonstrate you can formalize a theory, that's, that's an advance of some sort. OK, zooming in a little further then, we face a particular dilemma in learning analytics. And that is to move from innovation to uh, something that's going to live on. Okay? This is a challenge for educational technology in general. Um, how you go beyond prototypes, which was the name of a great report. Uh, that was written here um, by an open university team. How do you go beyond the prototypes? Program after program after program have funded ed tech research to uh, not as much impact as we would hope. Okay, so people like me and all the other people in learning analytics and AI ed arguably are developing novel forms of student-facing feedback and analytics. But we're in Pasteur's quadrant. It's use-inspired. And we need platforms that will scale uh, to create um, you know, that, that, that opportunity. So how do we create a knowledge infrastructure that will accelerate the transition from analytics innovations to embedded infrastructure? And part of that answer is the way that we're working at UTS. Um, uh, I wrote an article recently with Timothy McKay from Michigan, sort of comparing notes about our kick and his dig. Um, which are both centers, innovation centers set up outside of faculty structures to accelerate the innovation process into the university. So what does that look like? So this is KIC, okay? And there's the faculty structure, okay? We are straight reporting to the DVC for education, but we look like an R&D group. And then we work closely with the other people who are doing analytics in the university. So what we have then is a sort of hybrid center where we are both delivering services and doing innovation. Okay? Um, we are staffed by academics. We run a PhD program. We launch the data science in masters. So we're like a mini faculty too. So it's a weird kind of entity. And you know, part of my uh, enjoyment and fun and challenge is figuring out what it means to try and lead a, a group like that within the university. But it needs a university with a senior leadership who are up for that kind of thing, which is very exciting for me. So the kind of skill set that we need to do this, first and foremost, we have to have people who can talk to other humans. Okay, makes a huge difference. Uh, and they bring a whole set of skills. And we need to be able to talk at many levels in the organization. Okay? Uh, and I, I like to talk about it as the boardroom, the common room, and the server room. Okay? We are building stuff that the, the leadership must understand. I have to be able to explain to deans and associate deans for education why they should be interested in what we're doing. Uh, we work with academics who are, you know, without the academics, we can do nothing because we actually are piloting this stuff with students. And we have to talk all the time to our IT colleagues because we're talking about potentially handing them something they've got to run as a production service. Okay, this brings a number of advantages. First of all, I can get stuff done within the university in a way that I just simply couldn't if I was simply an academic buried in the, the faculty structure somewhere. Okay? So that's great. Get access to data, uh, work closely with the other units who are supporting students. Operating outside of the faculty actually makes me a sort of neutral person. Right? So I, I work closely with all the faculties, but I'm not actually in a faculty. So there isn't such a turf war thing going on, and that's helpful. And um, it's funded by the university, so you know, I'm deeply grateful I don't spend all of my life writing grant bids. I can actually plan for human and technical infrastructure uh, in, in the longer term. OK, so that was an answer to the question of how you stay in Pasteur's quadrant rather than invent something cool and then kind of move on to the next cool thing, because that's what the next grant gets, gets you funded for. Right? We, we are concerned about trying to actually get it into 
the everyday infrastructure of the university, technical and pedagogical. Okay, now we're going to zoom in. I'm going to look at you through the lower half of my glasses. And we're going to get material and, and, and physically detailed uh, about exactly how we build these systems. Okay, the first one I'm going to show you is looking at what I call the analytics uh, sort of integrity cycle, where we have people developing learning theories. An analytics researcher is then going to try and formalize that. A programmer is then going to build code. And at some point, different stakeholders are going to engage with it. Um, now, if you want to deep dive into this and how that relates to algorithmic accountability, then I'll, I'll refer you to this talk, which I gave here two years ago, actually. OK, but very quickly, a computer scientist is going to be tasked with taking that algorithm and codifying it well in the software and developing a user interface. A data scientist is going to be concerned about the relationships of you know, the software and the data down here, if you can see it, um, just to simplify things a little bit. You know, a user-centered design person is going to ask, how did all these people get involved together? To what extent did they get a voice in the shaping of the system? And um, what we care about here, of course, is the learning sciences. And there's a whole bunch of relationships going on here that we need to understand about the relationship of the theory up there the formalization into a model, the kinds of data that's being generated by this learning analytics system, um, the quality of the user experience. The, uh, okay, so because you know, a, um, a social cultural theory, which is all around focusing on this, the, the discourse of the students, is going to have expectations around the kind of data and user experience and learning outcomes that a theory to do with martial, you know, mastering algebra. It's a completely different kind of data, completely different kind of outcomes that we're after. Okay. And the question of how the learning sciences relates to analytics, for me, is, you know, we can sort of see how that plays out in here. Okay, so how do we think about the theory-analytics relationship? Um, I'll refer you to Paul Kirshner. This is, uh, you know, he gave our keynote two years ago at the LAC conference. So this is sort of a return match in one sense. Uh, Paul, in his inimitable style, you know, gave us a hard time when he'd found lack papers that talked about learning styles, and you know, some idiot had referred to self-regulation as a learning style. It's like, you know, so so we all got lambasted for that, you know. But um, you know, his brief message was, guys, put the learning back into learning analytics. Uh, the learning sciences has got a lot to offer you, and indeed it has. And he you know, painted various dystopic futures for us if we failed to take on board the learning sciences. OK. Um, David Williamson Schaefer, very, very exciting work. Probably the most mature work to date, I think, on how we bring qualitative and quantitative together. A bit of a quote here, but essentially he's saying, look, they don't have to be in conflict anymore. It's, it's not the quant-qual wars that we used to have. Um, Use stats to uh, not supplant grounded understanding, but to expand on it. Um, they're just alternative warrants for the kind of things we, need to, we want to talk about. I'm going to co quote Carolyn Rosé um, as well, uh, a chapter in the new handbook of learning sciences. How do we think about these things? OK, first of all, let's recognize that some people think that you know, data mining is about promoting a, theor a, th a theoretical approaches. Carolyn says, you know, I caution against the bottom-up a, theoret a theoretical empiricism. You know, I want to stress the role of rich theoretical frameworks for motivating operationalizations of variables. Let's strive for an intensive exchange between these fields. Okay. Computational tools are lenses through which researchers may make observations that contribute to theory. Let's use them as machinery to encode operationalizations of theory, languages to build assessments. Of course, big data and data mining is limited compared to a human analysis and all the richness that we can process. But of course, it's more powerful to the degree that the scope and the speed and the ubiquity, ubiquity of observation uh, that's possible. And, and it's, it's very encouraging as I look at what's going on to see the discourse in the learning sciences community about how we should think about theory and learning sciences 
related to computational approaches. And I've put some references here just that you can follow up later on. Okay. Um, Alyssa Wise, just before lunch, was presenting seven principles for our learning sciences aware analytics. Okay. How do we bridge from clicks to constructs? That's another way of putting that problem. Um, the way that people are doing this now, and those of you familiar with feature engineering will, will understand this, but if you're not familiar, imagine we want to measure conscientiousness. Woo, what, yeah, that's, that's a big word, right? We want to quantify conscientiousness in students, okay? So we've got Val Schutt uh, uh, and Ventura talking about stealth assessment. So what do you do? Okay, you say, what do we mean by conscientiousness? Well. There are some unobservable constructs like persistence, perfectionism, organization, carefulness, right? That's, that's just pure theory or based on educational research in, in the traditional paradigms. Okay, we might refine those a little bit further. But at some point in our educational game, we're actually going to be logging things from the system. Okay. Or let's take uh, the work of Sandra Milligan who wants to operationalize a new competency called crowdsourced learning. It's to define and characterize people who seem to be able to study well in MOOCs. Okay, how do we do that? She develops uh, a metric which talks about, um, you know, what does it mean when you're an expert with respect to epistemic standpoint and they'll do these kind of things, but at the other end of the scale, down the other end, the, the student will have a much more simplistic concept of what epistemic standpoint means, okay? That's the whole table and that's not all of it, right? But it's essentially a sort of grading rubric almost, okay? So we create a rubric that says this is what we mean by good and bad on some key dimensions. And then we have to operationalize it. So here we go again. Constructs on the left, peer evaluation, self-regulation, some behavioral indicators. You know, we're, we're gonna define risk taking as these three things. Right? And they will be gathered from looking at variables, blah, 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 and blah. We're going to look at the number of negative votes. We're going to look at the number of reaccessions to peer assessment guides. We're going to look at the proportion of video quizzes resubmitted. And eventually, we get down to system logs. Okay? So this is the way that we're starting to operationalize these higher order competencies in things that you could actually count and even give feedback to the student on in a MOOC dashboard at some point. So just to recap, I think there's you know, a quality dialogue starting to emerge between the learning sciences and analytics. And this starts to help us understand what would it mean to say our system has integrity, we can give an account of what's going on in there. This kind of thing and this kind of conversation is what counts. I just wanted to throw in something from HCI theory, okay? Because I come from that field. I want to point you to a great book by Yvonne Rogers, a short, slim volume surveying how the concept of theory in HCI has evolved since the 80s. Okay. Maybe we've got something to learn from this, because we started out with the psychologists saying, we're the guys who know about users. We know about memory and attention and visual perception. Um, so, and we bring a whole apparatus of experimental cognitive psychology to bear for the design of interactive systems. Okay. But since then, we have matured way beyond that. It turned out that psychologists could not do this. Right? The lab setting was too distant from the authentic, messy design setting that real systems get built for. Okay? So we've moved from modeling cognitive states to thinking about cognition as embodied, social, and distributed. You've seen a similar moves within the learning sciences. We have to be able to handle the complexity of real use contexts, not the student sitting in the lab doing an experiment for, for an hour. The person in the, in the noisy office continually being interrupted, multiple things going on, answering tweets, picking up the phone. That's the real context of the user. And we have to be able to inform design on a realistic time scale. It doesn't cut it to say, we can investigate that for you, but you know, it's going to take six months to plan that trial. Um, that may not be good enough to inform the next, the shaping of the, of the system that's under development. And so a useful table there, we might look at that and say, well, to what extent do we have different kinds of contributions into, into, from the learning sciences? Just want to flag two there, which are specifically about how you inform design. Okay. 
So that's the question for us there. The final lens to bring and, uh, is, is to really zoom in on the material practices of design. Okay? So I get worried when people are criticizing AI and analytics and data intensive systems, but they don't actually build them. Okay? Now, there is a role for outsider views, but we have to develop that ourselves. So I just want to show you very quickly, I know time's getting on, what it, what it means to involve stakeholders in the design of learning analytics systems. So here's one system. Um, we are going to try and design a system to give feedback to nurses on how well they did when they were treating a mannequin patient. And we are using participatory design techniques to help them draw the journey they take around the ward, where they would value feedback, and so forth. There they are actually treating a mannequin patient, and we have instrumented that space to pick up a whole set of different multimodal streams. And we are now able to generate a timeline. And I couldn't help thinking when Judith Green was putting up her timeline maps yesterday, well, we've got a version here, but this was completely generated automatically. We've got three nurses there. They're doing things with devices. They are administering med medication to the patient. A critical incident happens when the patient changes state, and then stuff happens, okay? And that's how we've been involved, involving the stakeholders in designing, conceiving, and then evaluating uh, that kind of dashboard. Another quick example, um, we've got writing feedback tools now doing natural language processing, and we want to know how do we involve the educator in, in designing a system that can pick up these moves in, um, in, in student writing. Okay. So one approach is I created a template in Microsoft Word, nice familiar tool, where we want the, the educator to go through the annotation that the system is putting on the text, and using a confusion matrix, you know, true positives, false positives, true negatives, false negatives, go through and just annotate in Word what, where, where those true and false positives and negatives are. Nice structured feedback for us to then have a conversation with her about. Let's make sure that the alignment of the rubric on the left aligns with the kinds of um, um, uh, class sentence types that the, 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 the parser can pick up. So that, again, the students understand why this feedback tool aligns with the assessment rubric they've been given. OK, I'm going to skip through um, this just so we can get to the, the end. OK. Um, this is all open source, by the way, and that, that's not just an advert, because putting it out open source, again, is another tr strategy for transparency and accountability. We want to build a community of people who are interested in reflection and writing and critical thinking and to probe those, probe those algorithms and test them. Okay. It's a high order competency and the machines will get it wrong. And we have been pulling on the work of Art Gracer, Sidney DeMello, that says if there's dissonance between what the student thinks and what the machine is saying, that could be a learning opportunity. So we have two strategies for handling the imperfection of analytics, which is to have very robust learning designs. So even if the technology fails, it's a meaningful activity for the students. And we explicitly encourage the students to push back. We tell them, remember, it's just a machine. If you don't agree with it, that's OK. We want to give them permission to, put, to have agency and to have autonomy and authority when they don't agree with the machine. So just to wrap up then. Knowledge infrastructure studies give us a sort of big picture account of what's going on in the educational ecosystem. But I think there's a risk that unless you have skin in the game, you may be perceived as shouting from the touchline. That will be the touchline of Bohr's Quadrant. At a micro level, we need these insider accounts of how design practices can bring disciplines and stakeholders together with integrity. And we start to see these insider accounts now. We've got the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency Conference run by and for machine learning people to, to talk about how they deal with these problems. Great book out by Adrian McKenzie. He knows about machine learning, but he's commenting on it in a very critical way as he describes the practices of machine learners. So that's the big question for us. How do we ensure that we, learning sciences and analytics, are on the same team and shaping the game? Are we turning out people who are equipped to shape that infrastructure in the future? 
And my take-home message is that we can do this. This is a very exciting time to be developing these new lenses for looking at learning and teaching. But we also have to know that we have to be providing an account for what we're doing. Uh, and if we get that right, then this is an amazing time to be doing this kind of work. Thank you very much. Uh, so Simon, I, I want to thank you for a, a really a fascinating talk and the, the kind of way you circled back to Iris's opening presentation is that I almost think you all designed it uh, to happen. It's completely emergent. Um, but I want to raise, so one of the things that you, that you did a couple of times in your talk that I think is really important is you, you mentioned the political aspects of this stuff. But it seems to me that in the way that you described your examples, the political kind of falls out of it, in, 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 whereas the social and technical pops up. And I, there are two, two ways I think this, uh, we might think about this. So on the one hand, when you talk about involving learners and educators and other stakeholders, those people live within communities, and researchers live within communities, and it's not the case that an individual learner or a set of individual learners or an educator actually represents clearly or, or any kind of way that, uh, comprehensive way, the values of particular communities. And, I, and, and so, in practical terms, if you look at, say, your nursing thing, the, the one stakeholder that I think is not in that uh, setting, which is pretty interesting, is the patient, right? And so, so the question I have for you is, how are you currently thinking about, or what are the ways you think we need to be thinking about the political aspects of these things in terms of how we, so besides getting theory and methods, it seems to me there are questions about to whom do we orient ourselves and to what purposes. So I, I just wonder how you are thinking about the political aspects of this stuff. Well, um, I think we need to be on the front foot and not the back foot, okay? We're gonna be on the back foot as soon as we start getting challenges from people who don't understand how systems work and we fail to provide decent accounts. I think we could be on the front foot by saying these are very important issues around privacy and accountability and transparency, and this is how we're dealing with it within the educational technology field. Right? We take it seriously, but we should be defining what integrity and accountability looks like in, in some senses. I mean, we're the people who understand pedagogy and learning theory and the way to build these systems. Right? Otherwise, I think we might have uh, other people trying to define for us what it might need, to, what it might might look like. So, for example, um, uh, I was talking, uh, I was uh, um, in, a, in a discussion where um, it was proposed that there should be um, a duty of care sort of law passed that affects AI systems. Right? What if a law was passed that AI systems must have a duty of care? Okay. Now, we should be able to define what that means for us in our field, right? We don't want other people telling us what, what we think that means. Or at least we should have a very strong voice. So that's, that's one way of answering that. We have to be on the front foot and able to communicate what we're doing in accessible terms to policy makers, advocacy interest groups, parents, as well as other academics who are looking at us with suspicion. So that's, that's one answer. Yeah. We have time for a couple more short questions, quick questions. You mentioned uh, several books uh, which present the reflections on all these things and uh, I was wondering if there is any reflection uh, that puts uh, learning analytics in a more historical context. I mean, uh, I believe that Piaget did learning analytics to construct his theory, but uh, today it seems that learning analytics started when we have the availability of big data. There is this connection, I mean, uh, but what we had before, uh, perhaps this can uh, help us to develop a kind of a science of learning analytics, something that's not just collecting data because there is the opportunity to collect data, which is leading to all these political problems that you are mentioning, and so that's What's your view about this historical thing? Thank you. Okay, so I mean, clearly, you know, 
what's now called learning analytics is not the emergence of an amazing new field where we study learning and gather data. I mean, that's been going on for a while, right? So, I mean, learning analytics needs to be defined as specifically the, the use of computational techniques to gather and analyze data. Otherwise, we're just talking about educational research in general. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's my simple answer. I mean, we can have a debate about whether the field has appropriated the name learning analytics in an inappropriate way, but we're kind of down to semantics and, and branding at that point. So, of course, Piaget was gathering data and building theory, right? But he didn't have available to him the armory of techniques that has now become available. Um, so, you know, but I may have missed you, a more subtle point you were making, so I'm very happy to chat more about that afterwards. But, you know, learning analytics is specifically, in my view, the use of computational techniques to gather and analyze the data. That's, that's what's new. Hello. First of all, thank you so much for this presentation and for organizing and presenting knowledge in this way. Um, thank you. You touched on this a little bit, uh, where you were talking about we need a new cadre of uh, scientists working at this intersection and that we need to take an active role with uh, PhD students to train them uh, for that work. How do you think uh, what you've been presenting today changes the way we train graduate students, especially in the learning science and le in learning and analytics? Um, what can faculty, what can departments do to really take actionable steps in that direction? Um, well, um, being, you know, getting experience in being in a design team and having people say, well, what does the learning, what does the learning sciences have to offer you, offer us here, right? We've got a problem. We're trying to understand this. You're the learning scientist. Uh, what have you got to offer? Okay. All right. Now, does that strike fear in the heart of the PhD student and, and his or her supervisor? Or, you know, I mean, that's exactly the situation that HCI was in. You're the cognitive psychologist. You understand memory and learning and, and, and recall and, you know, help us design a more usable interface, right? Okay? So that's why I threw that one in, because we may be able to learn from, from the journey they've been on for the last 30 years. Um, you're the learning science community. This is my first ICLS, actually. To what extent do you feel that you're, you're training people to contribute to design? And if you're not, is that okay? Because you're... You're, you're, you're a learning science. You're, you're simply studying the, you know, the, the fundamental processes of learning, and that's entirely legitimate, and you're, you're camped firmly in Bohr's quadrant top left. Right? But if you want to be top right, you have to engage in, in, in something that's going to create a sustained knowledge infrastructure. And if you want to be in the learning analytics game, you have to know how to shape technical infrastructure as well. And that could be you know, contributions of all sorts the kind of data to gather, the way in which you could back a claim, the kind of user experience that should, should result, whether that's co coherent and congruent with the underlying theory that's being claimed, et cetera. You know, we're building a constructivist learning technology. Well, what would the constructivist theory say about your tool by the time it finally sees the light of day? So you know, those are the questions and challenges that, 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 that I think that we face. Last one, and uh, I will keep it very quick, but uh, I think progressive educators for a long time have put central importance on uh, education as a subjective and phenomenological experience. The, the child authoring her and himself, and particularly for uh, toward, uh, an importance of civic education. Uh, and for a long time with, with textuality, it's been important to help people start to understand the processes through which they're making sense of the world. So how much do you think it's important that children growing up today have some insight into the, some of the computational processes that we're using to give them analytics? And how much is it OK that it remains a black box with the complexity of children? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, so two answers that might seem mutually contradictory. OK, on the one hand, we want tools that just work. You know, and nobody wants to be, have to learn how it works in great detail all the time. All right? On the other hand, so um, I'm particularly interested in higher order competencies which the machine simply cannot fully understand. I simply don't believe that we can model and quantify some of the deepest aspects of what it means to be a person and engage with other people. Right? Doesn't mean that there isn't a role for machines to be tracking activity, visualizing it in interesting ways to provoke reflection and conversation. And if the 
the, if, 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 the, if the people uh, don't find any insight from that, well, OK, fair enough. But ideally, we're designing things that provoke conversations that might not otherwise have happened, like that timeline for the nursing team. Okay? Before, it was just ephemeral. They had no way, they had no artifact that, that, that made it persistent and improvable and a, an object to talk about. You know? um, and you know, I was saying to uh, uh, the, the, the AI ed speaker, Tom, this morning, you know, his teaching the, teaching the phone to do something thing, for me, that looks like a, a golden opportunity to teach people about AI, right? Because they're gonna get frustrated, they're gonna struggle. Why can't the machine understand me? This is how machines work, right? This is you know, this gap between how we function as humans and how machines work, that's an amazing learning opportunity to, to exploit. You know. So uh, you know, I am the last person to argue for reducing student agency. Uh, I'm, what I'm fascinated with is how machines are gonna increase student agency because we are reflecting back to them stories and they can decide whether those stories are ones they own or not. And if they don't own them, why might that be? Could be because the machine's wrong. Could be because you don't have enough self-insight. You know, that's an interesting conversation to have. And that's a perfect spot to end the beginning of a conversation. Um, and I hope you'll thank our speaker, Simon. Thank you.